Next up, we will hear from Dr. Betsy Keller um, from Ithaca College, also on her work looking at exertion intolerance in MECFS. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm very excited to share this information with you, and I'd just like to say what, what Dr. Sistrom just said. Are there any questions? Because he pretty much just put a more specific period on the sentence that I'm going to write here with this presentation. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking first the 200-plus patients I've tested over the years using the two-day cardiopulmonary exercise test protocol. Um, without that information that we've gleaned from those patients and, and their willingness to do this, um, I don't think we, Cornell University and Ithaca College would have this collaborative research grant right now because uh, they, they have helped us to get there. I'd also like to thank my co-author, Joe O'Hare, who um, frantically put together a couple of slides for me regarding some physical activity data that we have just collected. It is an extremely preliminary, so no judgment there. And, uh, and I'd also like to thank Kristen Treat, who basically is my, my lab and clinic partner and does all the testing with me as well. So my alternative title for this, which was a bit long to put in the program, was a math problem. And I thought at 4.30, you can either you know, do your seventh inning stretch or you can give a little cognitive challenge here and try to solve my math problem and, and focus. Um, it, it basically serves as my presentation outline because what I'd like to do is focus not on everything in the math problem here, but on, on four of the constituents of this, of this math problem and see if you guys can solve the problem. And maybe a few of you already have solved it by reading the math problem. But um, we're going we're gonna to kind of wade through this in the next few minutes. And I'm going to move quickly because I have more slides than minutes. Um, but I need to begin by starting uh, a little bit of an explanation about the relationships, very simple relationship that we know all very well in exercise science and exercise physiology between heart rate and workload or heart rate and oxygen consumption. It's a linear relationship that we're all very familiar with and we've used that many, many times um, to predict what maximum oxygen consumption might be in an individual when we just do a submaximum effort test and collect heart rate. And with this relationship, we can simply, um, I'm going to see if I can, no, that's not it. You getting a pointer here? Okay, so with this relationship, we can actually do a submaximum effort test, collect heart rate during that test, and before they hit maximum effort, well before they hit maximum effort, typically this test ends around 70, at 70 or 75 percent of their maximum effort, but yet extrapolate that heart rate relationship because it's linear up to where their maximum oxygen consumption or workload would be. And so that allows us to do an exercise test on an individual and then predict what their maximum values would be, so to speak. And, and this is well established. It's well validated. Um, the interclass correlation for this relationship is quite high. And it's been used for decades in, in our field to do just that, um, predict from submaximum effort what maximum um, values would be. And we've used it with studies of MECFS patients over the years. And you can see here we've got several studies where we've looked at um, physiological responses to exercise, cytokine responses to exertional stressors, uh, brain imaging. And we've measured uh, patients during these tests um, submaximally and predicted what their maximum effort might be or their maximum heart rate might be. And so during these tests, these patients were compared to controls by having them exercise at 70% of their age predicted maximum effort. The problem is that what we have found over testing many, many, many of these patients, particularly with the two-day protocol, is that oftentimes the exertional stressor alone provokes what we call in chronotropic incompetence. And chronotropic incompetence is seen more commonly in heart patients, 
Um, and in essence, basically, the heart rate, these patients are unable to drive their heart rate up to the levels that we would expect of them during incremental exercise and up to maximum effort. And so when we, have, when we started seeing this in ME patients on a pretty regular basis, we were concerned because we know that some of the studies out there have made some um, conclusions based on matching patients with controls using submaximal data. When we started doing this two-day CPET protocol or cardiopulmonary exercise test protocol, where we do an exercise test, we measure their baseline oxygen consumption, we get their anaerobic threshold, we get hemodynamic information during incremental exercise, ventilatory data, everything that Dr. Sistrom gets except for the stuff that you get by sticking those needles in your patients. Um, and we, we also provoke post-exertional malaise. And when they come back on the second day, we measure them again to compare whether or not their oxygen consumption at peak effort changed and whether that altered their anaerobic threshold and the other pieces of information that we can look at. And when we look at MECFS patients compared to controls, so this is now 99 MECFS patients compared to 20 controls, we see that their oxygen consumption on day one for the controls is very similar from day one to day two, and there is a little bit more than an 8% drop off in this particular population of patients um, from day one to day two. When we plotted heart rate against oxygen consumption in the controls, we saw what we, I showed you in the very first graph, a very nice spread of data that we expected where heart rate increased incrementally with oxygen consumption. And when we looked at the MECFS patients, we saw somewhat of a, a nice linear relationship, but we also saw this clustering of heart rate down in uh, low levels of heart rate values. So we had far fewer MECFS patients who were able to drive their heart rate up over 150 beats per minute. So we looked at the ability of um, our control patients to meet what we would predict to be their maximum heart rate during test one and test two when we found that of our 20 controls, they were able to achieve age-predicted maximum heart rate. Here's their observed heart rate. Here's their age-predicted maximum heart rate. And also, again, do that on day two. In contrast, what we saw with the ME patients is on day one, this was their observed heart rate during the exercise test. This is what we would have predicted them to achieve based on their age. And on day two, it was a little bit worse. They were less able to drive their heart rate up and uh, even further from age-predicted maximum heart rate. And so ultimately what we found in this population was that about 95% of the control patients were able to achieve heart rates at maximum effort over 150 whereas only about 66% of the patients were able to do that. And when we brought them back on day two, all of the controls achieved maximum heart rates over 150 and fewer, only 60% of the ME patients were able to drive their heart rates up. So in comparison, let's go the other way. When we looked at the, just the ME patients here now, the 99 ME patients, um, their age predicted, 70% of their age predicted maximum heart rate, which is typically used when we, when we read these sub studies where they've done submaximum heart rate prediction to match workloads between MEs and controls, for this population, that would have been around 124 beats per minute. In reality, for this population, their age predicted maximum heart rate was 177. On test one, they achieved 158. And on test two, they achieved 153. When we looked at 70% of the actual heart rate that they achieved, it was 110 beats per minute on, on test one, whereas they were predicted to have been at 124 beats per minute. When we looked at their actual 70% heart rate during test two, it was even lower at 107 beats per minute, yet 
from their age, predicted, pre age prediction, we would expect them to be at 124 beats per minute. So in reality, these patients on test one, if, if we were assuming they were at 70% of their age predicted maximum heart rate, in reality, they were at 80%. And on test two, they were at or over 100% of their maximum effort while thinking that they were only at 70% of their maximum effort. So the Workwell group actually has some unpublished data in 179 patients where they've shown this um, as well. And so it's, it's quite common in this population. And um, if we think that our predictions are accurate in terms of using submaximal data to predict where our patients should be exercising, we should really be concerned about that because we're, what we're finding from, from this analysis here is that they're actually exercising at a much higher percentage of effort than we would assume they would be at. So, Low exertional heart rate is something that we're seeing quite commonly in this patient population and is, is one piece of the profile that we see all the time in these two-day cardiopulmonary exercise test results. The next thing that we tend to see in these patients is, um, is uh, ventilatory issues. So here I just selected one of the patients we studied recently because this is a pretty good example of what we see quite commonly in this, in this population. And this is a 39-year-old female who performed the two-day cardiopulmonary exercise test protocol. Now, she actually repeated her data quite nicely. Her VO2 peak was a little over 10 milliliters per kilogram of oxygen per minute, which was 38% of what we predicted for her age and sex. And she produced that again on day two. Her maximum heart rate was 120, which was 66% of predicted for her age. And on day two was 122. Her ventilatory anaerobic threshold she repeated as well. Just so you know, that anaerobic threshold is akin to about sitting in a chair at a desk. That's her level of effort when she gets anaerobic, or increasingly anaerobic. And that occurred at a heart rate on day one of 84 beats per minute. However, on day two, her heart rate at anaerobic threshold decreased to 77 beats per minute. So looking at this, you might say, well, this is an ME patient. And did she really work hard? Was she, was she a slacker? I mean, nothing changed from day one to day two. She actually kind of looks like our control subjects. However, it, these numbers are very, very low. And in reality, she worked very hard for us. When we looked at her respiratory exchange ratio, um, we see that she achieved respiratory exchange ratios, which are an index of how hard somebody's working. It's one of the pieces of information we look at during these exercise tests. And her respiratory exchange ratio was over 1.1, which is what we would like to see as evidence that they worked very hard. On day two, it was even higher, 1.21. Her perception of effort during the exercise test or RPE, rating of perceived exertion, was 19 on day one and 18 on day two. That's out of a scale of 20, where 20 is the absolute maximum effort one could exert. She was obviously working very, very hard. And signs and symptoms at the end of both exercise tests, especially after exercise test two, was extremely lightheaded and overall exacerbation of her generalized pain. And when we look at her ventilation values, what we see is that during both tests, her maximum ventilation volume at peak exercise was 22% of what, be, what would be predicted for age and sex. So her ability to drive up her ventilation to eliminate carbon dioxide was extremely limited. Her ventilatory equivalent of carbon dioxide was over, the slope of that ventilatory equivalent was over 40. Normal for her age and sex would be about 25. So indeed, she was not very effective at blowing off carbon dioxide during this exercise test. So we see low exertional ventilation um, in this population quite commonly as well. What was also interesting with this particular patient, and also unfortunately not uncommon, was that her systolic blood pressure, 
during test one, low to start with, I think we'd all agree that at seated rest, she is hypotensive with a systolic pressure of only 97. Now a normal, quote unquote, normal systolic blood pressure response to incremental exercise is that systolic pressure should increase about 10 millimeters of mercury for every one MET level increase in work. Well, that's a lot of gibberish, but basically what that means is that this number should go up about 10 millimeters of mercury from seated rest to 30 watts of exercise, which she did. And then from 30 to 60 watts, it should go up another 10, which she did, okay? And, and this is all I have because she hit her max value after that. She maxed out. We, she couldn't continue the test at 60 watts. When we brought her back on day two, as you can see, still hypotensive, yet she couldn't drive her systolic pressure up at all. And in fact, it, it actually went down very slightly. So she had a very attenuated blood pressure response during exercise throughout the entire exercise test. No effective increase in the driving pressure of blood leaving the heart to the peripheral vasculature. And I'll draw your attention to the systolic blood pressure during recovery here on day two. It also was quite low. But again, where is it going to go? After, after minute one of exercise here, we lie the patient down, raise their legs, and we were able to get the blood pressure up a little bit. It's not uncommon for us to get the highest blood pressure of the day, including exercise, after they're done exercising, when we lie them down and elevate their legs. That is when we may see the highest blood pressure, including all of their exercise blood pressures. Not unusual in this population. So low exertional blood pressure, another common finding in this patient population. So let me talk to you for just a couple of minutes about um, some activity data that we've been collecting as part of the collaborative research study that we're doing at Cornell University. We are using what's called an actograph accelerometer. It's a triaxial accelerometer that can be positioned on the wrist. It can be put on the waist or on the thigh. Um, and because we knew we wanted to measure for a prolonged period of time, we wanted to measure 10 days before exercise, which is what we're doing, and then 10 days following the two-day cardiopulmonary exercise test. We first opted for a means of data collection that would be most adhered to by our patient population, which is why we went with the, the wristwatch device. Um, they're waterproof. You can't go scuba diving with them, but you can wear them in the shower. Um, you don't need to take them off for anything. Uh, and most of the patients have adhered very nicely uh, to wearing this device throughout the entire 10 days before we bring them in for the exercise test. There's a lot of data you can get off of these devices. These are research devices. The way we have it programmed is that there are there are no lights or sounds or numbers or anything that appear on the watch. We don't want to encourage the users to interact with the watch in any way. So there's nothing that shows up. We program the watch to turn on on a specific time and date after they've received it in the mail, and then we program it to turn off as well. And uh, again, there's a lot of information, and, and I'm just showing you, and, and again, read my lips, very preliminary data that I'm just showing you, mostly because I wanted to sort of emphasize some of the issues that we are experiencing early on with this means of collecting accelerometry data. And so um, what I'm going to show you next, <laughs> that very preliminary data, is some of the uh, exercise, the activity data from these patients the blue would be our, our CFS patients, and the orange or whatever color it appears up on the screen there are our controls. And, and I'm not showing you this to have you start thinking about, geez, nothing's happening after exercise here for these, for these ME patients, because it is. But more uh, to the point, I want to illustrate some of the problems that we're starting to see with the wrist-worn device.
And I know some of you are interested in um, gathering accelerometry data on patients before and after exertion. And, and so this is, this is uh, just some information that I think is important for you to be aware of. So these data here are unfiltered, uh, or sorry, yes, unfiltered data. So when you set this accelerometer up, the default is you have, uh, the default is for what's called a low frequency filter to automatically be on. And what we decided we wanted to do was take the low frequency filter off, which we did because we wanted to capture low frequency movement since we're measuring a low active population. And here, this is activity counts, which are arbitrary units, but you can see we have very high numbers here. You, you probably shouldn't think of these as steps because they're not, but this could get you a lot of counts, okay? So without filtering out the low frequency movements, we captured everything here, and you can see we have quite high numbers. When we filtered the low frequency movements, the absolute values of these counts for both patients and controls decrease quite significantly, and you can see that the patients before their exercise test, on average, were lower active than the controls. I didn't show you their VO2 max data, but I can tell you that these seven controls have a lower average VO2 max than the seven patients. <laughs> so we have a very low active group here. Um, but the data, sorry, the data is actually, is, a, is quite messy and of some concern because what I think is playing a role in some of the messiness that we're seeing is not whether or not this device is act, uh, validated for low active individuals, it is, but you wanna make sure you, you selected a research device that is validated to use on low active individuals. But with the wrist worn device, we're actually seeing the influence of a population that spends a lot of time on keyboards or devices. And so we're getting a lot of wrist movement that is probably influencing some of these values. So something to think about, if I had my druthers, I'd love to see this worn on the waist or the thigh. Honestly, I didn't think we would get 10 days of adherence on the waist or the thigh, but it's something for you to think about if you're gonna measure for a shorter period of time. But they have been very adherent wearing it on the wrist. Um, and with this device, you can actually get uh, physiological correlate, well, you can get heart rate, but that requires the patient or the subject to wear the polar heart rate strap on their chest. Not going to do it for 10 days. It's not going to happen. So we're not getting heart rate data, which I would love to have um, in, in conjunction with this activity data, but unfortunately, we, we knew that wasn't going to work well. But it is an option with this device. So back to my alternative title here, uh, we looked at low exertional heart rate or chronotropic incompetence, low exertional ventilation. We see quite often in many of these patients, low exertional blood pressure, also very common finding. And I might add that in both cases, with, well, in all cases, heart rate, ventilation, and blood pressure, we may not see this on day one, but when we bring them back on day two, unlike the patient I showed you, we provoke these responses. So they may appear as just a normal, low-fit individual with normal respons physiological responses to exercise on day one, but after the exertional trigger, they come back and show this to us. Or we may see this on day one and day two, like you just saw with the patient I showed, and exertion intolerance, pretty much across the board. So in summary, I would like to um, just point out that chronotropic incompetence is something we see often in this patient population, not 100% of the time, but very, very, very often. And it needs to be taken into consideration, especially if you're considering doing a submaximal effort te test to use data to predict any maximal effort indices on these patients or predict a workload for them. And that we commonly see abnormal exertional responses in heart rate, ventilation, blood pressure, and exertion intolerance my own personal preference is to relate this to a blood flow issue. Thank you, all of the speakers who have previously implicated that. Um, while we have not measured it, we also always measure pulse oximetry. 
and we have normal pulse oximetries in these patients, and yet we have these abnormal physiological responses outside of that. So any guesses as to what I think this formula is telling us? Anyone? <laughs> okay, to me, this smacks of autom autonomic dysfunction. When we look at all of the symptoms that we see in these patients over and over and over again, I have to look at autonomic dysfunction as, as a, a sort of the, the common denominator and what they're telling us with their exercise responses their patient medical history, their family history, et cetera, et cetera. We see this all the time. And the interesting thing about exercise testing these patients is the heterogeneity that you see at rest in, these pa in this patient population all of a sudden shrinks to show us these abnormal responses over and over and over again. So my picture of an ME-CFS patient is, is this, in contrast to the huge diversity that we see when we collect all of their um, other data. And, and I want to finish by just mentioning a couple of studies that have been done recently and previously, or reported recently and previously. And one is reported only a mere 30 years ago, cardiac function at rest by Montague and colleagues. And um, this graph should now look familiar to you. Heart rate data during incremental exercise, normal healthy people, ME-CFS patients, chronotropic incompetence. And, the, and Montague concluded that, in summary, the results of the study indicate that patients with chronic fatigue syndrome have normal resting cardiac function, but a marked limitation of exercise capability. We weren't doing ICPETs at this point, of course. And went on to say that although inconclusive, the data are compatible with latent viral effects on cardiac pacemaker cells or their autonomic control, skeletal muscle that are unmasked by the stress of exercise, further studies required to delineate more precisely the pathophysiology and etiology of this not uncommon and disabling syndrome 30 years ago, not uncommon. Lily Chu and, and colleagues at Stanford just published a nice epidemiological overview that I concur with 100%. Having taken histories on 200 of these patients, I would have to agree that when we look at the overall response, human stress response, autonomic nervous system response, and autoimmune histories that these patients have, that that they have done a very nice job in characterizing them in that, in that article that just came out. In terms of future directions, I think, of course, we're all, all going to continue to look at what might explain the etiology of this disease and search for that elusive biomarker. And now you'll hear my own personal bias, because I think at this point we need to continue doing that. But we also need to, and the patients deserve, that we focus on management uh, of this disease and helping patients to mitigate the symptoms that they experience and we're so busy studying. So I would urge you to pay attention, clinicians, to the relevance of the low normal patient, the blood results that don't really go outside of those high and low markers, but they're consistently low or they're consistently high when they also accompany an individual who is reporting all of these symptoms that we now know comprise MECFS. And I'll be maybe the sixth person today, and this really, this really does my heart good to be able to say this, the sixth person today to encourage a much more individualized, precise, nutritionally guided approach that's based on the underlying genetic vulnerabilities we see in these patients life stressors and events that contribute to who they are now. In other words, their epigenetic influences that have made them what they are today with this illness as we think about how we want to, how we want to help manage the symptoms that they experience. Thank you. I can take a few questions. They're not hard. Um, I was wondering um, what your th 
Uh, if you could comment about how your patient population differs from patients that have more typical symptoms of POTS with exercise-related tachycardia, um, and, and what do you think the, the relationship there is? You know, it's interesting, and, and I can't, we have te certainly tested patients with POTS, and when we exercise stress them, it's not unusual for us to see Oh, I'm not doing that right. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's not unusual for us to see um, their blood pressure sort of snap into line with what, we're, what I showed you today. And the heart rate variability that they experience at rest attenuates, actually. So I've, I've seen that, and in in, in not in a data set that I can report to you, but I can tell you that we have tested quite a few POTS patients who are diagnosed with POTS, and we actually see exercise in, in some weird respect kind of normalize their cardiovascular response. However, their exercise capacity is overall attenuated. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, Joe John, Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, you know, in the office, we have so many things to face. So uh, these issues of autonomic dysfunction raise the issue of, you know, where in our set of priorities do we put them? In view of the fact mentioned earlier also that uh, exercise testing itself may induce post-exercise malaise itself. We may not want to subject our patients to this. Can we, uh, can we substitute uh, uh, Fitbits and, uh, uh, and their, uh, their mobile, mobile devices into determining that they are unable to, uh, to increase their heart rates, they have autonomic dysfunction, focus on that, give them that diagnosis, maybe ask for help from cardiology or pulmonology consultants, and move ahead that way. The underlying question is, how often are, are, are clinicians doing exercise testing in these patients, uh, and, and where, you know, where would you estimate its value now? Well, I, I think that's a good question, um, but I, I, I thought where you were going was, with that was what, as a clinician, can I do to provide guidance without a lot of fancy tests <laughs> and, and exerting tests? But um, I, so often, I'll be, I mean, my disclosure is that I do these tests often, most often, because patients seek me out to do it because they need objective evidence of impairment. And um, I, I pretty much every time I present, I, I usually start out by saying I, I look forward to the day where I never have to do an exercise test on an MECFS patient again. But their reality is that their Financial means will be cut off if they don't provide some objective evidence. So people, you need to give them objective evidence without us having to exercise them. Um, in terms of exercise guidance for them, however, what I, what I tell them um, if I have not exercise test them is to, I have some guidelines that I'm, I'd be happy to share with you, but in general, um, to wear the Fitbit or the other device, realizing that if they actually do know their heart rate at anaerobic threshold, which is what I use to provide an exercise prescription for them, if they do know that, to be aware that the Fitbit may not be as accurate as the ECG I had on them during the exercise test. And if they find that they're adhering to my heart rate at anaerobic threshold guideline and they're still um, experiencing post-exertional malaise, that they need to downregulate their heart rate guideline. If you don't have that information and you don't want to exercise test somebody, then what I would tell them to, is to live at a level and keep a journal such that later that day or the next day, if they're experiencing any post-exertional symptoms, then they need to downregulate to the point where they don't experience post-exertional symptoms, recognizing that post-exertional symptoms can be brought about by physical, emotional, and cognitive stressors. And, and so they need to do a little record keeping and say, well, what I did yesterday r really trashed me today. I can't do that. I've got to lay lower or I've got to take more frequent breaks. Short exertion, three to four times that amount of exertion time as rest. Does that help? Yeah. There's a time left. Yes. There. And there with the left. left. Oh. Sorry, everyone, sorry to cut off this okay. uh, excellent discussion, but in the interest of keeping on time, that, that, that I'll have to sure. be the last question. But hopefully anyone else that still has questions, we can continue the discussion in the Q&A session in a moment.
thank you so much, Dr. Keller, for another excellent talk. And next up.